So I'm Scott Murray, and this presentation is Building Container Images with Open Embedded and the Octo Project. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I've been using Linux since 1996. Uh, the first few years, I did some hobbyist stuff uh, for my own amusement. And then in 2000, I started actually working on Linux for a living, uh, doing embedded and non-embedded desktop software stuff. Uh, the last few years, I've been uh, working for Consulco Group, uh, currently a principal software engineer for them. Uh, Consulco Group's a services company. We specialize in embedded Linux and open source software and kind of run the gamut of hardware, software, design, build, development, and uh, we do training, and we're a Linux Foundation training partner. If you have any interest in that, you know, come up to one of us and ask about it. Um, so it's a San Jose company, but we're quite distributed. I live in Toronto, Canada, and we have people in Europe and all over the US. Uh, so quick agenda of what I'm gonna try and cover. Um, so a really hopefully quick overview of Open Embedded and the Octo Project. I'm hoping that everyone has got a reasonable familiarity with those. Uh, a little you know, sort of spiel about containers, probably also something that most people here have some knowledge of already. And then I'm gonna talk about what Open Embedded can bring to the container sort of situation. And then I'm gonna walk through some example uh, build configurations that I've been tinkering with to try and build both full distributions and application sort of microservice type containers. And then a little bit about nesting images to try and build a like factory install, sort of pre-installing application sandboxes in an image during the build process, which is surprisingly not, not an easy thing necessarily. A um, few caveats, I am not a container expert by any stretch of the imagination. When I submitted this talk, I thought it would be a good, you know, good opportunity to learn some, so I have been doing a lot, of <laughs> a lot of Googling and learning things. But this presentation, I do not really go into the details of how you would take the images that are being generated and actually using them in, with Docker or Run C or any of the other tools. Um, as well, container technology, every month there's some significant change. I might have missed something you know, in the way of tooling that uh, if you know of something quite useful, either come up to me afterwards or during the, I'm gonna you know, take questions at the end, hopefully you know, throw something up. Um, and I am assuming a bit of open embedded and you know, Yocto project and you know, maybe a little bit of you know, Docker knowledge um, because I'm not gonna go deep dive in some things. So our hopefully quick summary of Open Embedded and the Octa project. Open Embedded is a build system and the metadata to build embedded Linux distributions. It is not itself a Linux distribution. The Octa project is a collaboration project. This has been running for eight years uh, to aid in the creation of Linux products based on you know, Open Embedded as the technology behind it. And the Octa project provides a reference distribution called Pocky. Uh, which is built with Open Embedded and provided by the Octo Project. And that, so that's, the goal is to have that Pocky acts as a starting point. Um, I refer to uh, Pocky and some of the configurations, but I'm trying to do things in my example configurations that would also work if you just use plain Open Embedded yourself and don't use the Octo Project uh, Pocky. Uh, some quick feature list here. Um, so one of the big strong points of, of Open Embedded is has very broad CPU architecture support, basically because vendors support uh, it with BSP layers that they actually maintain themselves and contribute. Um, so the layers are basically a way of customizing your configuration. So it basically has stacking metadata, and that's one of the key strengths of Open Embedded and, and the Octo project. Um, because it's an embedded, you know, Linux distribution sort of tool, um, that's sort of the focus on with it. I have worked on projects where we've built server-side stuff with it, but um, the goal is usually in an embedded system to build small images, so that is kind of one of the focuses of, of Open Embedded. Uh, it's notable for a regular release schedule. Basically, every six months, there's a release, pretty much. Um, it's one of its strong points is integrated license and source publishing. Uh, compliance tools, um, which make it quite easy to publish your license, you know, information for an embedded system, and actually, you know, archive your source to provide to somebody who asks for it. 
Uh, one of the sort of current projects that's ongoing for the last couple of releases is full binary rep reproducibility, which Debian has also been working on, which is, is a, you know, boost your confidence level in your images that you can reproduce the contents. And it's also, there's some security benefits there as well. Uh, so containers, uh, you know, no surprise hopefully to anyone, are uh, basically operating system uh, level virtualization as opposed to virtual machines that basically virtualize a whole machine. Um, Linux implementations, you know, have been around for a while. I mean, basically this is like, you know, going from Shroot to something more, more substantial. Uh, nowadays it's namespaces and C groups, the Linux control groups feature. So, I mean, the, sort of the old school tool these days is uh, Linux containers, LXC, but then Docker and Run C and even Systemd has Systemd and Spawn which allows you to actually, even with a stock Linux system with systemd installed, run a you know, system of containers if you put your mind to it. Uh, to muddy things a bit, uh, nowadays there's actually is work on what the, you know, they refer to as lightweight VM technology. So clear and CATA containers actually do virtualization at the machine level, but it aims to be so lightweight that it doesn't have the performance impact in startup that uh, typically VMs do. And that's because that's one of the key strengths that people have for containers is quick startup and e ease of, of starting and lightweight resource usage. So these are new technologies to try and get the benefits of VMs in the same space. Fortunately, that's all I'm going to talk about in that, about uh, uh, CATA containers. Um, there isn't really an uh, integration uh, in upstream open embedded. There are some layers floating around, but uh, when I was looking at, the, the, looking at it, they're a bit stale. So there's probably some work to be done there. Um, container images are, you know, run the gamut. You can do a full Linux distribution install in there, or um, nowadays it's more typical to have small images with potentially a single application and just its dependencies. Um, that's pretty common now in this microservices model and, you know, having Kubernetes orchestrate a big system. Uh, so continue that vein, the common use cases are Sort of the more old school thing is, is trying to run an application that has, you know, gone stale. It doesn't actually, you know, on a new, new system doesn't have libraries that will work for that application. You can sort of run it inside a sandbox uh, sort of, you know, container and actually run it with its own set of libraries and actually get that it will run on a new system. One of the uses for that is uh, builds. You want to keep your uh, potentially builds running on newer machines. You know, when things shift over time in the tool chain or in libc, you can get stuck with, you know, your build doesn't work anymore on a new system. That's one of the use cases. Um, sandboxing a, an application to isolate it, so this is more of the security sort of idea where you basically can't see the whole file system or all the other processes. Um, there's, you know, debates on how good, uh, you know, container security is versus virtualization. I um, mean, it's improving all the time, but I mean, nowadays, or, I mean, it's a heavily researched area. You know, the, the black cats are always trying to work out how to get out of a container environment, break out of a namespace, but it has come a long ways in the last few years. And so the other use case I sort of already mentioned is microservices with this like starting on demand for orchestration and, you know, potentially migrating services from one machine to another. Um, so typical container construction uh, these days is you start with a minimal system, a Debian or Ubuntu, or very commonly now Alpine Linux, which is quite small, and then you add your required packages that you need to run your software or your particular application. Um, and then you might actually compile some things, um, actually install a tool chain, build a particular piece of software using its build process, and then you actually prune down, you might remove actually the tool chain that was in there and everything other, you know, the source for that application you might have compiled to try and make a very small image. And that's desirable because it reduces the attack surface, less software is better in, a, in the container, it makes it easier to maintain, again, from having less software, and migration time in systems where you're actually shifting containers from host to host in like a, you know, cloud scenario. Smaller is, you know, easier to transfer, less time. So, um, what are the potential drawbacks of, you know, some of these types of things? Um, these sort of common, you know, scenarios of how people build containers. Uh, re reproducibility is not necessarily great. Um, in Docker, you sort of rely on 
people keeping the labels uh, sort of sane and not overwriting an image and keeping the same label um, and being good about actually versioning things. Um, that might not be obvious if you're actually running a Docker file. It might pull down something different than the last time you ran it. And unless you're careful to pay attention, that would be a surprise. And that comes into like the base Debian and Alpine images might upgrade. You need to keep track of what's going on. Um, and then you see things in Docker files. You know, I'm not a Docker expert, but looking around, people do things where they do an automated app get update and upgrade because they want the latest bits, which is good. I mean, security-wise, that's, that's smart. But unless you're actually careful to track what's happening when every time you run the Docker file to make a container, it might be quite different each time, right? I mean, you have to go look at the package you know, manager and see what's in there. And as well, there's things where you see people talk about, well, you can pin a package version in, you know, in apt or APK, but I have seen reports of things where people go to reproduce a container and Alpine basically don't archive necessarily all the old versions of packages. And so you go to reproduce and it's gone and you can no longer build that without doing a very intense web search to find an old version of the, the package. And that's not ideal, really. I mean, if you, if you want to actually be able to tell people this, we know what bits are in these images and we can reproduce it, that's not good. As well, I mean, so that, as I've sort of been reiterating, you, you actually have to put some effort in, in this scheme with like, you know, using doc files or other mechanisms to compose images. Um, and so some of that is a trust issue that the upstream is not gonna change on you. Um, and so this comes into this transparency and sort of a security aspect of it. You do have to trust the builders of the base container images. Um, and so if you're you know, paranoid <laughs> or your lawyers are paranoid, um, you wanna really be sure that you know the origin of the bits that are in the image. And so, I mean, distributions, I mean, you, you, this, you can build up a tr you know, confidence level, you know, trust Debian that the developers actually aren't gonna sneak something in. But then there's the, you have to be sort of sure that none of the Debian package maintainers are gonna sneak something in and get it by people. So it's, you're kind of at the whim of maybe distribution update policies on the security front and having, you know, if you're pulling in a large amount of software in a container for something large like Node or, you know, Python sort of software framework, it's, it's definitely a challenge potentially. And of course, there's also uh, anyone who's done much container work, it's a very common refrain of, well, containers, if you, you know, uh, OpenSSL has an issue, you have to update every container image to pick up the, you know, CVE fix. Um, so, I mean, that's something that I'll address about, I mean, you can just do your app get update, <laughs> rerun your Docker files or whatever and build new images, but it's not necessarily ideal. Um, the other thing is license compliance. Um, potentially, we're not talking about a lot of software. I mean, Alpine is, is quite minimal in a base image. It's only several packages. But, I mean, if you do have a legal team who wants to be able to produce a list of the software, the licenses, be able to produce a source archive of everything that's in an image, that's not straightforward necessarily uh, without being quite familiar with the package manager and being able to script up pulling it out of, you know, apt or fetching all the source packages and, you know, scripting up a mechanism to build that. Um, so that's not ideal. Uh, customization is where things really get more sort of wonky for if you're, you know, it's one thing to have a Docker file that does, you know, wget such and such tar.gz, configure, you know, make, blah, 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 blah. Um, but if there's a package that's in the distribution and for some reason you want to change its configuration and need to rebuild it, um, ideally you would do it with the, something that's compatible with the package manager. And that kind of gets into the state where you might actually need to know more about building packages with the distribution's build process, you know, using its package build. Things like um, open build server ease that a bit, but then it gets into things where if you were trying to do uh, containers with a distribution for some reason on an architecture that the distribution didn't support, bootstrapping something like Debian or Alpine is a pretty big job if you've not done it before. Um, and so that's not something the average person is gonna do. And so in an embedded system, say you wanted to do sandboxing and you wanted to use a very small 
distribution and you want to use Alpine and you're on a MIPS system, you're gonna be in a, you can't do that basically, you're kind of stuck. Unless you really like build systems. So, is open embedded in the Octa project a solution to these types of problems? I'll sort of run through the same list. Uh, reproducibility wise, we have a good story. Um, basically, you can rerun the build using the same set of metadata and should get the same results. That's improving all the time, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning. Ideally, within a couple of releases, it should be the case that with the right configuration, you should get the same binaries every time. Uh, several distributions are working on that, but you will actually be able to pretty much do that yourself. Uh, transparency wise, because everything's bootstrapped and scratch, you have all the source in hand. If you want to audit things, you have it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, on the security front, there's 18 months of support per open embedded release, or Octo project, depending on, there's a fine line of who's actually doing the QA there. Um, but um, it's sort of been discussed about long-term support releases for, for open embedded, but it hasn't really taken off yet. Um, so if, on the other side, we have Debian is pretty much five years. Um, from what I can tell, Alpine is a two-year promise with some potential exceptions uh, for certain packages they might actually do updates for. Um, so that's not actually, open embedded doesn't look too bad in that sort of light. Um, license compliance, that's pretty much all built in. Uh, basically, by default, you get you know, license manifests. Uh, you can do license text archiving, even inside the image if you want to have it contained um, with the container. Uh, source eye carving is a pretty straightforward thing to do. So we're, that's probably one of the stronger arguments for using open embedded for containers. Um, on the customization front, because it's a, you know, pretty much a, the purpose of Open Embedded is to be very flexible. Uh, the layered metadata in the build process, you can almost customize anything, but it comes into your skill level. I mean, simple config option tweaks are pretty straightforward, but if you get into wanting to change tool chain security flags and stuff that becomes more involved, you'll have to be somewhat expert you know, in tool chain stuff to do that. Um, as well, pretty much any architecture that, that a BSP layer exists can actually be targeted. So that's useful for embedded if we want to do sandboxing with container tools. Um, we can do it on platforms that don't actually have mainstream Linux distributions that are geared towards containers. We can build our own. Um, so then we get into sort of more general issues. Um, package availability of, you know, what's, what's the story there? Uh, so Debian and Ubuntu, it's really hard to come up with a, a good sort of solid number, but it's tens of thousands of packages. Even for ARM, it's, these days, it's tens of thousands of packages. Alpine, from what I can tell, they pretty much build 5,000 packages with their system. They have a custom system, so that, but it is in the same ballpark, but not as dramatic as Debian. Open Embedded at the moment is about 2,300 packages by going re by recipe count. Some of those are going to be tool chain ones, so it's not necessarily a, a really solid number there. But that's in the Open Embedded core and meta Open Embedded layers, which are pretty much heavily, the heavily QA layers. So those recipes are likely to be usable right off. But there are many more recipes if you actually start searching around but then your confidence level of, of reproducibility and how well the, layer, the recipe for that software is gonna work will be not as good. Um, one thing to note is uh, Open Embedded's Node and Python module support is, is there's quite a few like of the commonly used uh, packages that there are recipes for, but given the, you know, the sort of rapid development and the sort of wide array of, of new modules popping up that people wanna use in their stacks, um, that's probably a bit of a, a problem. You might actually have to write recipes for some of those yourself in order to use them. Um, which would be good if you could then upstream them to the project and the cycle would sort of continue. But um, then on the easy use fronts, um, one of the things that you, know, you get with Debian or Ubuntu or Alpine is the like app get or APK install sort of experience where you're pulling from a package feed. You can do that with Open Embedded. It's a bit more work to configure than probably the average person is 
really going to be comfortable with necessarily right off. It's not the most well-documented part of the project, in my opinion, um, but it's doable. Um, there are enough wrinkles that it's probably not something everybody would do. Um, and so that kind of means that it's maybe more the case that small, relatively fixed content images are going to be the thing that will be more straightforward to handle with Open Embedded. Um, resources. It's a new thing to learn. If you haven't used it before and you want to jump in and start building container images, you're going to be a, you know, there's a little learning curve. Um, you know, it's a build process, so there's potentially quite significant hardware resources if you're building, you know, much software. Um, and long-term maintenance might involve actually dedicating someone to keep track of the project and, you know, sort of focusing on it. Um, so that said, so there are pluses and minuses. I'm not saying this is going to change your life and this is the way that everybody should build containers. That's, that's not a slam dunk. Um, so on the, to get to the sort of mechanics of, of what we would do with Open Embedded. So back in the Pyro release last year, I believe, recall correctly, or late 2016, uh, there was a container image type added. Uh, and so on the, uh, here. In your configuration, you can just set the image file system type to container, and it basically produces a tarball with, there's no kernel. It actually disables post install scripts because you're not going to have a normal init process. There won't be run. And then you have to set the uh, kernel to be the dummy kernel, which basically won't build anything, and that's it. You actually will get a tarball with just what's configured in the image. Um, so, that's how we would build a container. Um, if we actually want the tools to do something with that container, uh, like on target, basically, um, there's a meta virtualization layer. It provides the sort of gamut of you know, Linux containers, run C Docker, which is not quite the latest version, but it's in the current master branch is close. Um, as well, it's got the open container image tools. Um, and there's configuration frame fragments for the Linux Yocto kernel that when you pull in the meta virtualization layer will add the required kernel configuration to actually run container tools. Um, one thing to note um, is there's currently no support for uh, building you know, like an OCI or you know, a Docker image during the build, which would be, mean like running a Docker file or you know, doing Docker compose type of stuff because Docker basically has a daemon that it has to have running in order to do most of these types of operations. And that's a kind of a difficult thing to achieve with the build process. Um, I'm poking around. There there's many web pages where people talk about alternate ways to actually use different tools to try and actually build a container without using Docker itself if you actually want a Docker-compatible container because it has its own format. Um, I haven't actually figured it out yet. Um, if anyone has any ideas, maybe come talk to me or throw it up during the question period. As well, um, Togan Labs, they have a booth down in the uh, vendor showcase. Uh, they have a Oryx Linux uh, distribution that they support, and it's basically based on open embedded, and they offer a commercial support package for it. And they actually have container support as part of their system in Oryx, and they use run, run C. Uh, from the open container folks as the, uh, the sort of container running system on the target. And there's the URL there. I haven't played with it yet. Uh, might poke around at some point just to kind of see how they do some things. But it looks pretty much like they use meta virtualization and grab the tools. So, uh, but they, they, go talk to them at their booth if you want some details, I think. All right, so I sort of rushed through the pros and cons, why we might want to use Open Embedded, and you know, Yocto project for building container images. I'm going to try and get through my examples before I drastically run out of time. Um, so I have a few things in mind when I sort of submitted the talk. One is it'd be nice to have a container image that I could actually run an Open Embedded build in. Uh, it's, I mean, I, you know, most people carry around like a Debian image or something to kind of give them maximum compatibility for doing builds. But it's, 
been a thing for a while that Open Embedded has a thing called the Build Appliance Virtual Machine Image, which is inside the Open Embedded distribution you can build it. So it can self-host its own build. And I was like, well, I'd like a container to do that and not have to worry about building the VM image and stuff. So that's one of the things I've tried to accomplish. Uh, another one was to see, well, how close can I get to something that's like Alpine, uh, Linux, um, size-wise, you know, hard, how hard is it to sort of get sort of similar functionality? And so look, look at some configuration options to do that. And then there's the building a single application container, so the typical microservice type of thing. Um, and then my sort of ideas around building an image that's preloaded with application containers. And this would be potentially useful for factory image builds if you're doing sandboxing of applications on your target. All right, so this is my example for a build container. And so for most of these, I walk through how you would just sort of ad hoc do it by putting things in local.conf, which is the main configuration file for open embedded. Um, if you've used it at all, you've probably tweaked things in open uh, in local.conf. So here I'm actually just setting the machine to the x86-64 QMU compatible machine. I'm setting the FS type to container, which as <laughs> mentioned gives us a sort of bare bones image. Um, I'm actually setting the kernel to dummy because that's required by the uh, container image type. And so one of the things is I actually have to set the locale to be included. So I'm setting a language here because um, Nowadays, uh, Open Embedded, the BitBake tool is, is Python 3, and it needs a locale in the image to actually work. So I have to actually tell it I want one, uh, because I'm going to build a core image minimal image, which normally wouldn't have any locales in it. And then this is the magic. These two package groups are defined in OE core in the build appliance uh, stuff. There's actually a package group self-hosted uh, recipe that these are two package groups out of four or five, but these two are enough to actually build an image on top of core image minimal. These two package groups give you all the tools to actually do a bootstrap build. And so when you build this, it's about 150 megabytes for QEMU x86-64. The build process is interesting because the, the self-hosted package group, the, the build appliance has <coughs> got a graphical desktop, an extremely minimal one. But you, when you do a bit bake, that package group gets built, all of it. And so you're, you, it's interesting because web engine, I think, gets built, which takes a lot longer than you'd expect building something like this should take. But then it doesn't actually end up in the image. So that means if you were trying to build a minimal image or you want to reproduce this quickly, you might tweak some things to try and speed that up uh, and maybe prune out a few things. Um, so because the container uh, type, uh, image type, turns off post install scripts, things like the volatile directories functionality that's on by default and open embedded, break is maybe too strong a word, uh, it doesn't do necessarily what you expect because without those init scripts running, there's a few directories missing. And some software works perfectly fine, but the build does not. So uh, to work around that, we need to sort of populate a few things. And it's var volatile temp is one of the, the sort of big ones. Um, so we could actually script up a little bit where we take this container image that we get and actually run the init script that ends up in it to create those handful of directories. We could tweak it as well in our, like make an image recipe and, and basically create them by hand as well. That's, uh, there's a sort of couple of different options there. Um, the base files package is what controls the creation of these volatile directories. We could BP append that and actually tweak the recipe to change the behavior. Um, as well, your user for doing your builds needs to be created. The build appliance VM image actually adds a special, it has a recipe that adds a builder user. Um, we kind of want to work around that necessarily. You might actually want to have your own local user. So that gets into more like Docker configuration or systemd and spawn, tweaking with nspawn config. Um, and as well, your build tree to actually get at it, you need to do Docker volumes or do some bind mounts. But it works perfectly fine. I was doing test builds, works fine. And this is something I'd actually probably tinker with some more because I would like to actually have support for this in upstream open embedded 
it actually seems quite useful. Um, so to follow up, this is actually a, an image definition of sort of some of these ideas without actually having to do it in local.conf. You could make a layer, put this image definition in it, um, and it sits on top of uh, open, like it was just OE core pretty much. And if you bit bake build container, you'll actually get an image that actually pretty much works. And you, then you can actually run bit bake inside that container. Um, one of the things to note, I have thrown in adding the X4 type. That's sort of a convenience thing for systemd end spawn. Um, you can just stick an X4 image into the varlib machines directory and uh, it just ends, it runs systemd uh, container or end spawn to start it. So, and this is my sort of hack for fixing the temp directories um, <laughs> using the root, rootfs post process command hook. It's not pretty, <laughs> but it does work. Uh, time. Um, so, one of the things is uh, you start poking around is uh, using x 6664 um, it would be nice if I didn't actually have to set preferred provider virtual kernel to use the dummy kernel. And there's a, one extra little package that x 6664 pulls in that is not useful in a container. So this is like a machine definition you could throw somewhere, you know, like you know, make a, a small little BSP to use for containers uh, that would basically turn off, I think it's V86D is the package, and uh, force the use of Linux dummy without having to just add it to local.conf all the time. So that's, okay, so that's pretty straightforward. That didn't seem that bad, actually. It was, Took a little bit of, you know, wrapping my head around what the self-hosting package groups were gonna be needed and things like that. And some tweaking to, but it, it's not that bad. It doesn't take much configuration to do that. So let's try and raise the bar. Let's try to do like Alpine-ish type of image. So one of the things about Alpine is it uses the muscle uh, C library instead of glibc. That's probably the biggest size reduction that, that they get is doing that. Um, I've you know, the previous talk, but probably I assume that was discussed. I've spoken back in the spring also what size reduction muscle is the biggest bang for your buck in reducing sizes of uh, open embedded images. Um, so this pretty much gets you not that far off, actually. You can bit bake core image minimal with this container sort of configuration, and just switching to muscle produces something that is not that big. This is the image manifest. And so there's a few odds and ends in here that you wouldn't think you'd need. This doesn't use my uh, machine definition, so it has V86D in it, but it has a few other odds and ends. It actually has a sys, uh, five init hooks. It has the update alternatives for the O package package manager. I'll talk a little bit about, you can prune these things out actually, uh, because you're not gonna actually have init scripts run normally in one of these containers. You might, because by default, Alpine supports that. You could do that. You could actually run init inside this container and actually start up multiple things. But most people don't actually do that. You can still go ahead and prune those out. So, as I mentioned on this slide, so this actually is about 4.8 megabytes. Um, but there's no package management. And so Alpine uses its own package manager, APK. And so if I actually configure with O package, as the package manager in the image, we do end up at eight and a half megs, which is in the ballpark of double the size of an Alpine image, unfortunately. Um, one of the other features of Alpine is it signs all its packages. Um, that's configurable. We can actually do that with O package and open embedded. Um, we can also do it with RPM, but when you turn on RPM as the package manager, you get an image that's about 100 megabytes. So, that's pretty much a non-starter, I assume, for anyone who wants to do microservices. That's quite a bit larger than you could do with pretty much anything else. Um, and like I said, further pruning is possible. One way is with a custom distro configuration. And as well, all the like update alternatives and things like that, there is an option that's not really obvious called force RO remove, which is force read only remove. Because when you build a read only image in open embedded, I mean, it's pretty obvious you're not gonna actually update the alternatives links when you install packages, because you're not gonna install packages. And so, when you build an image that's read-only, all this stuff gets pulled out, 
but a couple releases ago, a knob was added to force that behavior. So if you set force our own remove, a few other things get pulled out of the image, which in our use cases, if we're not gonna use package management, that's what we want. So this is a example of a sort of custom district configuration. Um, I call it schooner. <laughs> I can explain that to somebody if they ask me later. Um, but it's this very minimal, just a like sort of ad hoc thing. The big takeaway here is I am basing off of Pocky, but I, you know, change the name and stuff, but I am setting Muscle as the default C library. And this is the sort of big win here is I'm actually setting a very minimal distribution features. Um, and so this cuts out quite a bit of stuff. If you look at distribution features with bitbake minus E on just regular Pocky, it's like three or four lines of stuff. Now, a bunch of it is, is coming from this variable, but just all the other variables like blue Z and pulse audio and things like that, which we're not gonna want any of that in our container image. And these variables are used by the uh, uh, core image sort of functionality, the, the de default uh, image types in, in uh, open embedded. And so if you set these, a few other things get pulled out. So the init scripts and the init manager and things like that. So if you're gonna make your own image type that doesn't base on the core image, you don't need to worry about these. But if you wanna make a dist this default distro configuration, it's nice to actually have these defined to do what we want. <coughs> All right. So remember a little bit of that. I'm actually gonna, the, some of these subsequent examples I actually use schooner.conf when I'm building them. So we've built our sort of Alpine-like thing to see what we can do. Let's try and build a minimal app container, just a single application and its dependencies. So this is my base for that, where I attempt to build as little as possible. And so basically I do you know, sort of set the container type I'm attacking on X4 because I want to use systemd end spawn at one point. But here I'm actually turning off all image features by default, no language support, and I'm disabling recommendations, which is a mechanism where you might not have a hard dependency on something, but you can recommend that it be installed for utility. You can turn that off. And then it makes, if you need something, you have to explicitly say you want it. And then I actually define, I do want things like the default directory structure, so like Etsy and dev and things like that. So they, they're available for things to be mounted on them by the container tools. So that's base files. Base passwd gives us that sort of initial sort of blank, you know, or whatever, default passwd for things to actually be able to look up UIDs and stuff. And then netbase kind of, I think, tax in Etsy hosts sort of default values. And then I also sort of hook up the, my sort of, Fill, fill in for now my scheme for actually making sure that the volatile directory stuff is handled. So if we say that's our template, and then I want to build something with that. So my first example here of doing that is I actually build a minimal image with uh, light HTTPD. Um, and so I pull in that previous image definition and add to it. And so as the comment says, um, light HTTPD actually requires bin sh when you start poking around and trying to run it. <laughs> um, it. It actually execs some things and needs a shell. Uh, so that previous image you will build, you won't actually get a shell in it. So we have to add it to get it. And because we disabled recommendations, um, we have to explicitly add a couple things that were sort of recommended. Interestingly, when you build an image without those two things and go to run light HTTPD, it fails because the default configuration refers to them. So that's maybe an interesting thing I need to poke at somebody because that sort of goes beyond recommendations. If it doesn't actually start without them, I'd almost say that's more of a, an R depends as opposed to a recommendations. But what does this produce? A very small image. It only has these packages in it. Three of them are the ones we specified in our image template. And then basically we get just the dependencies, muscle for the C library, and then like libcrypto and libadder basically. And I believe a PCRE one I think is also gets pulled in by muscle. And it's quite small, it's just the application. So let's try something a little more substantial, another web server, NGNX. 
Um, it basically is very sm similar. I mean, th that's the goal of having that templated app uh, container image uh, BB file. Um, so we can just basically image install plus equals. Um, <coughs> so that gets us an image with just that. Um, I think I'm getting close to running out of time here. But so a couple of notes there. Bash might get pulled in. There's a mechanism that looks for scripts and might pull it in. So let's be aware of that. If something is actually going to exec things, you need to have BusyBox. Um, and because post install scripts get disabled, you may have to do some tweaking. So I'll try to quickly run through uh, the sandboxing example, because this is some of the more interesting bits that I haven't seen too many people talk about. Um, so we've been building container images with this previous examples. And you know, so you can Docker import them, you could run Docker Compose or some of the other OCI image tools, and then you actually, on your target that you've built Docker into the image, you could fetch them, or other tools, run C. Uh, but what if we want to actually do a factory image that already has some of those like light HTTP or similar type of app container images? Um, how could we do that? Um, so right now it's a bit constrained. Uh, system D and spawn, it seems doable from you know, experiments. Um, the other things, it's not really obvious how to do, except maybe doing an image for the target device that used a post install script to do an import of the image. That we could sort of orchestrate that. Um, so there's two approaches. The simple-ish one, uh, Jeremy Rosen talked about at uh, Embedded Recipes last month. He gave a somewhat similar talk. Um, and so it basically uh, is sort of straightforward, but it has some restrictions on machine distro and libc configuration uh, between the container and the, the target image. Uh, as well, I sort of did some other sort of tinkering. There's a multi-config feature and newer versions of Open Embedded gives us some more flexibility where we can actually mix and match between the container build and the host build. Uh, Multi-config, if you want to look that up, there's this URL here to the documentation. And just note that multi-config dependencies are a somewhat recent addition in the newest version of Open Embedded. Um, and so I'll mention later this, some things happen. All right, so I'm down to a few minutes. So here's my, the simple example. So we sort of follow on. I make a recipe to package up the image that we previously built. So this is the app container image light HTTP, uh, HTTPD. I'm using it as a source file, and I'm in basically including it into the target root file system. And then I have an R depends on systemd container because that's the tool, that that package includes the tools we're going to use for systemd end spot. Um, so this is an interesting thing where uh, that's pretty much all that's required. If you bit bake this, it'll build the image, then run this recipe to basically stick the image that was built into a package, and then that package will go into the root file system. And to use it, it's as easy as this. You make a host image definition and just image install. You just add that recipe to it. And when you bit bake this, you end up with a root file system that has the container already in it. Which is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not, it's interesting. It's a, I won't say hack, it is interesting. Um, it was interesting to see it, and when I looked at, at Jeremy's slides to see if I had any point in giving this talk after his, but uh, I did find that the multi-config stuff he hadn't really talked about, because it's quite new. So. If you look at uh, Jeremy's slides from Embedded Recipes, um, he sort of walked through that example. I, I used the container class in mine. Um, but multi-config is a system where you can actually configure for different, basically it's almost like you have different local.confs essentially. Um, so in your local.conf you just set bb multi-config to list the different config types, and then you make a multi-config directory and put a separate conf file for each of them. So in this one, uh, basically to hopefully quickly run through this, I am basically defining that the host has systemd, that's what these options do, and the container, I'm using my schooner distribution class, or distro uh, definition, and my machine type. And I ha I'm actually sending it so that when the container stuff builds, it goes into a different temp directory, 
And so here's our multi-config version, and this is the magic here. So this dependency actually makes it that our do install in this recipe doesn't run until the other configuration's build of the container image has completed. And so if you look at the documentation, this is the pretty much almost the example that's in the, uh, the documentation of one image relying on another image. And this also works. It does give sort of the same result. Um, the build process looks a little different than the output from BitBake. And this is, we actually accomplish things a little differently in our image. The, this is the MC depend, multi-config multi depends. And so this is the dependency that we're actually defining. And this is an image class. We're not actually using a recipe to grab the image. This is, and actually we're doing it in the image definition. And this is the example that's in the documentation for Open Embedded right now. And this works. The other approach, when I actually try and make a recipe to pull the other image with the multi-config dependency, it fails. So that's something I'm, I started poking. I, I talked to Richard about yesterday, the Open Embedded Maintainer. I have to generate some log files and we have to sit down and work at what's going on. Um, I, and I mentioned I had a set tempter. That is probably, there's some incompatibility between muscle and glibc building the two images at the same time. Ideally, it shouldn't have to be required that you set tempter. And then one of the drawbacks is that I have to sort of dig down from the top level to get at the image. It'd be nice if I could just say tempter and deploy dir and avoid having to specify all of this. So it's sort of a work in progress. And uh, that's my talk. I sort of rushed through there uh, trying to fit it all in. I don't think I actually have much in the way of time for questions. But it is the coffee break, that's a good point. So if anyone has a question, feel free, if you, unless you're gung-ho to go for coffee. Hello. <laughs> First, congratulations on being one of the few, probably the only speaker getting the terminology right. <laughs> so yay. Thank you. Uh, the Linux dummy, are you using the upstream Linux dummy from OE Core? I am, yes. OK, I just pasted the link to a slightly longer version that installs the headers so external modules don't fail, which okay. is useful for well, non-container, uh, I don't care. <laughs> no, but a, a package like Lighty can recommend an IPv6 module, which will trigger kind of thing. So yeah. I needed it for my containers. OK, all right. That's good to know. Are you going to upstream that? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, another question. You derived Schooner from Pokey, Pokey and yes. overrode basically everything Pokey does. So Well, I've, there's a bunch I've, of other stuff in Pocky. I didn't feel like trying to fit on a slide. If I, I was doing it for real, if you were doing it for real, you'd probably actually do a full file. That's what he's getting at. You wouldn't actually require Pocky.com. you just actually fill in. There's like another 20 lines of stuff, basically. I, I think you can just delete that and depend on what OE Core sets as defaults, because the defaults work nowadays. Yes, that's. This is a Linux Foundation talk, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Octo project is the approved project. <laughs> well, not approved, it's a stronger word, but it's the. It's the sort of Linux Foundation backed project. Thank you. But any other questions? If you can come up to the mic, or hopefully. So one of the things you said at the beginning as a challenge of containers was um, the library updates can affect multiple containers. Um, so how does this address that? <laughs> it has sort of the same problem, although in this case, uh, my sort of expectation is you'd be building all this yourself. So it's very easy to script builds with, with you know, BitBake and, and Open Embedded, is that my imagination would be you'd pull the update and you'd run your build process and you'd recreate all your container images in one go. You wouldn't be stuck going out and tweaking Docker files potentially and doing, you know, compose or, you know, whatever you would do to actually regenerate all your different containers. This might get it all in one shot potentially if you've, are, you know, put the care in to set up your build process right. Uh, and because the tools, this is all command line tools and it's all pretty much bit bake this image. And so it's pretty scalable to do builds. Uh, the, the, didn't really mention it, but the state cache for uh, open embedded 
If you're making these container images and you're only making like a change of adding a, a package to an app container, the builds are gonna be actually quite quick after you get the initial tool chain and all that stuff built. So if you're just tweaking one library and then just do bit bake of like these bunch of different images, it'll probably be very quick, actually. So. Cool, thanks. So there might be a benefit. Yes, sir. Yeah, one last thing. I, I wanted to just your, your open question about if you wait about two to three weeks, meta virtualization will have a, a BB class to it, build the oh, yeah? OCI containers. So. What's your, how did you cook up a scheme? <laughs> it's, using un, it's using the tools that are in there already. Oh, the, yeah, the using the image, image tools. Yeah, and Unmocky and oh, yeah. all the things that are there already. So. That's good. good and, we, and if you jump on the meta virtualization mailing list, you can find our So you, do you end up with a Docker native? In no, the OCI, OCI compliance. So uh, you can run yes. them with run, C, or Docker, whatever okay. you want. So, all right. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's yeah. good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you very much.